Good evening to everybody. Here we are again for the part two of this live stream to do with caravan parks. Um, as per last week, it's just me, I'm afraid. So no producer, no techie. So it may be a little bit clunky. Not sure if it was last time. Forgive me if it is. And for the person who asked on live chat, no, there's no makeup, no person doing hair um, and no person in wardrobe. I'm afraid it is just simply me. So let's repack, recap Sorry, what happened last week. So last week I discussed pitch fees and in particular the annual renewal of pitch fees. And I included, I'm sorry, I concluded, sorry, that based on the agreements that I've seen, and that's not many actually, but based on the agreements I have seen, including the BHHPA template, as I'm going to call it all this evening, um, that the current position is unfair. So what I mean by that is that where you are told every year that there's going to be an increase, the way that increase works and the way that term is in that agreement, in my view, my very firm view, is simply contrary to consumer laws, um, the current law being the Consumer Rights Act. So that's the starting point um, as to where we got to last week. We also spoke about bully boy tactics, and that is where parks are telling people that if you complain, if you mention the word legal, if you send us a complaint letter, talk to lawyers, you're going to be out of here. We're going to terminate your agreement. And I concluded very firmly again last week that that's not on, that's contrary to the law. Now, whilst I haven't seen any agreements that I've seen a clause that says they can do that, there may well be some. And if there are, that also is simply an unfair term and will never, ever be enforceable. And I am interested to hear from anyone who actually has an agreement that says that. I don't think there will be any. I think the parks are just making their own interpretation as to what they can and can't do. Some of these clauses have what we call, sorry, these agreements have what we call behavioral terms, where they set out all the behavioral things that you have to abide by. Well, of course, complaining can never be one of them. So that was where we reached last week. I think it was good news for you because it meant there is something we can do. Um, and of course, following that live stream last week, I announced that I've been contacted by BHHPA. Um, but I'm going to pause there for a moment because I thought that was as in the British Holidays and Home Parks Association. I think you thought that as well. I now know that actually it wasn't. It was, in fact, the British Holidays and Home Parks Alliance. Uh, very confusing. The name's almost the same. And when you announce yourself as BHHPA, you're naturally going to get confused. But don't worry, because the, the I don't want to say the real, but the other BHHPA, the one that you and I all, we all thought was the one that contacted me, has now contacted me. I have now spoken to the Director General of that organization. And again, to confirm, I'm talking about now the British Holidays and Home Parks Association. Um, if only they could have made that name easier to say. I'm now going to refer to them for the rest of the e evening as BHHPA. When I do that, that's who I mean, the association. They have been in contact. They have now said to me that they are interested in what I've been saying. Um, they didn't say it, but I think they're probably concerned about what I've been saying. I think park owners are probably concerned about what I'm saying. And if they're not, and there'll be many of you watching, I know you should be, because this is a sector that needs change. It needs urgent change. And either you're going to do it because we're going to try and work together to get to the right position, or I think a regulator is going to step in and do it. Either way, it's going to happen is my firm view. So the BHHPA have basically invited me to provide comment, to um, provide an amended license agreement. So they've given me their template in a word version. I'm currently amending it um, to um, reflect what I think the consumer laws say, or should I say what I know the consumer laws say. And I'm going to send it back to them and say, look, if the agreement says this, then it will be compliant. That's only one very small part of the problem. Then all park owners need to look at their current agreements and make sure that they reflect the template, which will mean either replacing agreements or amending them, probably amending them, to make sure that there is no one sat on any of these parks or at the moment sat at home um, who has an agreement with terms in which, frankly, breach the consumer rights protection laws, the Consumer Rights Act predominantly. That's where we need to get to. And also, I've said that I'll express a view on practices that are happening a bit like this. We're going to terminate you if you say the word complaint. That should not be happening. That need to stop. 
So I do see this as a way forward. Some people have contacted me and said, well, we've heard it before. They've said they're going to change things. They never have. I'm hoping this is different. I'm hoping it's different because this time there is someone um, with 20 odd years experience in consumer law who has a media platform who's going to keep shouting from the rooftops until this happens. And I have to say, and I'm going to um, <clears throat> congratulate might be the wrong word, but I'll use that the BHHPA because they seem very willing to engage and discuss this. And I think that should be, that's a good thing. Um, they're not there to represent um, caravan owners, obviously, but they are there, there to represent the industry and the park owners. And in my view, they've done the right thing by engaging. So at the moment, um, I am confident we're going to get somewhere because uh, I think they'll listen. If they don't, then I won't stop until we do get somewhere. That's my pledge, my promise to you. So that's where we are at the moment. And as I say, we're making progress. Now, this evening, I want to look at what I'm calling tied services. And what I mean by that is the situation where a park says we have contractors that we use and either you must use them um, and therefore you've got no choice, i.e. a tied service, um, or if you use someone else, we've got to approve them. And maybe they make it so difficult to approve that you end up using their services. So the question there is, is that lawful? And a good example of this that people have been telling me about is obviously building decking. Um, most static caravans have decking around them. And it, if you've bought one that's new, it won't have that. And you'll have to get it built yourself. Um, and this is the type of situation where I'm hearing people are running into problems. Um, also, the other thing I'm going to discuss this evening are the terms that park owners impose when you sell your caravan. Because again, lots of people telling me that this is a big issue um, that you are finding. You're finding that maybe you can't sell them because the terms are just so draconian, they're difficult, or you're losing lots of money. So is this a lawful thing? Are the terms lawful? And I'll be looking at that as well. Now, I will be taking questions. Last time there were so many, I couldn't deal with all of them, but I will take questions. Um, please try and ask them in order. So what I mean by that is I'm going to start off by talking um, not about the tide services, but but about the other parts of the scene, the contractors. So ask me questions um, in order so that you I don't sort of get tied up in trying to find the answer, the questions that I should be um, answering. Um, and also, I will also tell you the next steps at the end of this as well, where I think we're going to go afterwards. There will be many things that I don't deal with this evening and that I didn't deal with last week. That's because there's only so much time we can do um, on an evening with these things. So what I'm going to do is when I finish this evening, myself um, and my team will look at all the questions you've been asking that I've not covered, where I've not covered the law, I've not answered your question. We'll collate them all together and I'll make a video where I'll answer every single one of those questions. So I sweep it all up. What will then happen is I will draft up um, this proposal to the BHHPA. Um, I'll liaise with everyone first and consult to see this is what I'm proposing to send. Does anyone have any comments? And then I'll send it in and hopefully we'll get somewhere, but we'll take it from there. So that's the plan. That's what we're going to do this evening. Hopefully we're not going to be here for 10 hours um, because it is quite a bit to do. Um, but um, I say, I can't stress enough. I think we've already made some progress. Um, I am just going to say this. I have heard from some park owners this week um, and after the live stream last week who were very um, clear that they had listened and they wanted to make sure that you as effectively their customers we're going to be happy. And I have heard that there have been some changes this week where some of the parks have come in and said, okay, we're going to give you some rebates or some refunds um, for pitch fees during um, the pandemic period. I think that's great. They've done that. That means that what we're doing already is being successful. If any of you have heard this, that this has happened to you, you've had some success already. Let me know. It helps to know. Um, I think also I'm going to say that we had 18,000 odd people watching the last live stream and viewing the update video. That sends a very clear message because that shows me and it shows you and it shows importantly the likes of the Competition and Markets Authority, who I should now refer to as the CMA, that there is a very big problem. 18,000 people do not watch a live stream if there is not significant consumer detriment occurring in a sector. Um, not in the in the short succession that you've watched it. 
So that's a very clear message um, to the likes of the CMA, why we're here and why we're talking about this this evening. Um, hopefully we'll get the same numbers again this evening to show, you know, continue this is an issue. But again, where park owners have done something to rectify anything, let us know because it is right to congratulate them on that as well. Uh, and I hope there's a bit of that. I don't know. I've been hearing there is, but you'll let me know, um, I assume. So let's start with this. Can park owners force caravan owners to use its contractors, i.e. decking and everything else? As I said, I'm going to go through the legal position with this. Feel free to start asking questions about that. Nothing else, just that. And when I finish doing the legal position, I'll, I'll try and answer as many as I can before I move on to the next point. Now, the starting point with this um, is, as I said last week, it's the Consumer Rights Act, because that's the law that predominantly deals with this area. And that's where we need to start our journey. And I do it as a journey through the legal minefield of what the law says to work out whether these park owners um, are doing something wrong or whether what they're doing is perfectly within what the law says. So that's where I start um, this evening. Now, the Act says that a term in a contract will only be fair if it abides by the requirement of good faith and it doesn't cause any significant imbalance in the party's rights and obligations um, to the detriment of a consumer. So if there is any imbalance and it's the consumer that's um, on the worst end of the deal, then technically that's going to be unfair or potentially it's going to be unfair. Now, you are significantly significantly imbalanced as a consumer if most of the burden is placed on you and the benefit of the obligations are um, on the trader, in this case, the park owner. So if there's a term in a, in a license agreement, which basically gives all the rights to the park owner and you really get nothing out of it at all, then potentially that could be unfair. That's the starting point where we go from here. I'm going to explain this and develop it more as we go along. But that's the thing we need to have in mind because this is very much a legal argument. This unfair terms is not, we're not talking about ethically. This is not an ethical argument whether, oh, it's really bad that you do that. No, this is not what it's about. Park owners won't listen to that. Well, they might do as a matter of good customer service. But I come with this from, from a, a legal standpoint and I need to try and wave a legal wand at the situation. So that's where I come from. Um, now, one of the things I mentioned last time was that within the Consumer Rights Act, and I put this on the screen now, we have Schedule 2. And Schedule 2 of the Consumer Rights Act provides a list of terms that may be unfair. Now, I'm stressing that because all of the terms that are in this list are not necessarily going to be unfair. It's a case-by-case -case basis. But what the law is saying, these sorts of terms may be unfair. In fact, I'll go further than that because what the law really is saying is they will normally be unfair depending on the circumstances. So that's something we have to keep coming back to when we're looking at terms, in this case, whether they can force, the park owner can force upon you to use one of their contractors. Now, the starting point for me now is to look at the BHHPA template agreement and to see what that says um, about this subject matter. Now, again, some of you will be saying, well, I don't have that agreement. Mine's much older. I'm going to come back to that. But for, for this evening, as the same as last time, I'm going to start with that agreement, look to see what that says, and explain to you where that's right or wrong, because that will then show you whether your agreement is right or wrong, i.e. if any of the terms are unfair. So that's where I start this evening. Now, if we go to clause 4.11, and again, some of you may have this agreement, some of you may not. The, the clause numbers may be the same in different versions. I'm not entirely certain to be honest with you. And if they're not the same, what it says on the screen there may be the same in your agreement, even though it's an older one. Again, I'm not sure um, if that's the case. But that's what this, this clause says, not to carry out. And this is your, basically your obligations as a, as a caravan owner. So you're promising in this agreement that you will not carry out any building works um, at the park or erect any extension to the caravan, ultimately without their permission. Um, and then I then go on to clause 4.12. And that's where it says to give us written notice, i.e. you say that you promise you're going to give the park owner written notice of any work 
to be carried out to the caravan by external contractors to ensure all contractors employed by you provide us with the relevant documentation. Now, let me start by saying this. I see no problem with that clause because that clause isn't basically saying you can't use your own contractor. It's not tying you to use the park owner's contractor. That clause on the face of it is perfectly fine. Now, I'll pause there for a moment because I fully appreciate that your, your agreement, your license agreement may not say that. Your license agreement may say that you expressly cannot use your own contractor. That's a different issue, which I'll come to shortly. But the template agreement as it currently stands doesn't say that. Now, again, if we look at that, this is the BHHPA saying, this is the gold standard. They don't call it that. I'm calling it that. But they're basically saying to their members, this is what we want you to sign up to. This is the agreement we want you to have with your, um, with your customers. Now, when I spoke to the BHHPA, they told me that they had spent lots of time on this agreement, worked very hard to make sure that it was transparent, good, needs to be, that it abided by consumer laws. Again, good, it needs to do that. And that there was nothing in here which was unfair, not necessarily saying they've achieved that part, but we'll come back to that. That's what they're saying. Now, that means if you're currently in an agreement that doesn't have this clause and they're a member of the BHHPA, and by the way, if I say that wrong this evening, you know who I'm talking about because it's a bit of a mouthful that. Um, but if it says something contrary to this, I believe what you should be doing is going back to the park owner saying, this agreement I've got is outdated. It, there are clauses in here which are now contrary to the new template. Will you agree to amend those clauses that are outdated? That doesn't mean amending the term, by the way. That stays as it is. It's just amending what I'm going to call offending clauses. So let's come back to this again. I say this clause is perfectly fine. Perfectly fine if. Now let's go to what has to happen in addition to this. They, of course, must not unreasonably withhold their consent. So if you go to them and say, I want to use my own contractor, the park owner shouldn't be making every excuse under the sun to say no. Because if they do that, they've given you the right to do something where they're not really ever going to allow you to do it. And of course, that's going to be deemed unfair immediately. Some people have told me that that is their situation. If that's your situation, then that's unfair. That's contrary to what consumer laws provide, and you will have a claim. And again, that I'm going to come back to a lot of things later, but that's one of the things I will come back to. So there's a starting point with that. Now, if you find that you go to a park owner who has this agreement or a wording very similar to that, and you say to them, I want to use my external contractor, and they fail to come back to you, I'm hearing that, then so long as you leave it a reasonable amount of time, which in ordinary circ times would be no more than 14 days, in the current climate, I would suggest would be at least double that. And in any event, you can't really get on to do anything anyway. And then they still fail to come back. You can take that as a deemed acceptance because they can't, they also shouldn't unreasonably with um, delay such permission as well. These are all the things that should be added to this clause for it to be fair. And the fact is not written in there. You can take it that they are implied into this contract and therefore they should be doing that as well. So as I say, I'm, what I'm saying here is that basically, um, the clause is okay so long as they do all these other things. Now, this clause will give rise to three scenarios. Scenario one is that your agreement contains something identical to that. Maybe you've got the template that I'm talking about. If that's the case, <clears throat> then you should be okay so long as the park owner doesn't unreasonable withheld or delay such consent um, and therefore doesn't refuse when they really shouldn't be refusing. Scenario two is the, the situation where your agreement expressly, so it does not expressly say you cannot use your own contractor, so you don't really know, um, but the park is saying that you can't. Well, in that case, you're just going to say, well, there's no contractual right for you to basically demand that I use your contractor. It's not in the agreement. Let's pause there for a moment. Remember, I have, I've always said this, that the contract must be very clear. We keep talking about transparency as well in the last live stream, must be transparent. You must know as a consumer 
what you're getting into before you sign the dotted line. If you don't, anything that comes up after the event that you've signed up to but didn't really realize is very rarely going to be binding. And of course, if it's not written down and the park owner comes back and basically says, well, actually, you're bound by this, but they never told you this. It's not in the agreement that, in my view, will never, ever be binding. And you can just say no. Um, and I know that from many people have been telling me that's their situation. So even though I'm using the benchmark of this template agreement, I do understand it actually doesn't apply to many people. This is probably what um, the BHHPA is saying is going to happen in the future. And that's great. Um, but it doesn't help many of you. But as I say, if this is the situation you find yourself in, then you do not have to go with those contractors um, in that situation. Now, if I just go back to um, Schedule 2, now we've spoken about what happens if you don't have this in your agreement um, and what happens in, in that situation. Now, the Schedule 2 has, a, again, a list of terms that may be unfair. And term 10A, I'm going to put it on your screen. It's not term 10A, it's paragraph 10A. It says, a term which has the object or effect of irrevocably binding the consumer to terms with which the consumer has had no real opportunity of becoming acquainted before the conclusion of the contract. Now, this could be the case here, as you will have agreed um, the term that without knowing what the contractors are going to charge. So you may say, well, actually, Yes, I know that the park told me that I have to use their contractors. But unless they told you what that contractor is going to charge, or unless they put a clause saying um, it will always be a competitive rate comparable with anyone else in the market, that clause will be unfair. So I'm going to, I don't want to go too fast with this because it can be um, complex. This, but let's just recap a moment. If you have the clause that says you can use your own contractor, with consent, that clause is perfectly fine if that consent is reasonable. If they give you the consent quickly and, and they don't put lots of conditions on the consent, that's fine. If you have a clause that says you have to use the parks contractor, it will only be okay if it comes with a caveat that that contractor will be um, obviously as good as anyone else, provide a reasonable service, and that the cost will not be any more than what anyone else would charge. Now, at this stage, lots of people are screaming at me saying, well, no, not, it's much more expensive, maybe because they're going to get a commission. I'm going to come back to that in a little while because I know that is a problem. Um, but if that's if none of those factors are there, then that clause would be okay. Now, the other thing that can happen that I've heard is that some people have said, well, I do have the clause that says I have to use um, the contractor which is on the park. Um, as in their own um, contractor that they put forward. And I went to look to ask them to do something like I wanted to do decking or something else. And they gave me a ridiculous price. So I therefore ended up not doing it. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is you've given them the right to come back to you and put you off doing anything. So that gives them a backdoor way of stopping you doing things that you should be able to do. And this is why if you've got a clause that says, um, you have to use our contractor. It's only binding if you've got the clause that also says we'll always give you a fair price. Otherwise, you're signing up to potentially a problem where you are getting into the park owner having the right or the ability to stop you doing anything just by putting the price up. And that's another reason why this would never be fair. So if any park owners are watching this saying, well, we've got that clause and it's perfectly fine. No, it's not. I could probably argue in front of any judge in the land that it's not okay and it's an unfair term. And that would probably be my golden argument, which I would win on every single time. I've won on um, arguments in court on similar matters like this, where the consumer just doesn't know what the terms could be in the future. It's never, ever going to be fair. Now, I've gone through two scenarios. The third scenario is where the agreement is silent, i.e. it says nothing about contractors. Um, and in that situation, um, you can take it that you'll be able to use your own because, again, I said this a moment ago, unless the park owner can point to a legal term, a binding term in the contract that you agree to sign up to, it cannot enforce it. And I think it's actually a dangerous game for a park owner to ever try to force upon you um, their own contractor 
because it is fraught with problems because you can say, well, I don't know they're any good. You'd assume they would be good and they've been specifically chosen. But again, you can say, well, you know, the pricing's high and all the rest of it. It's a dangerous game for them to play. But I should just say this because it is always a two-way street, this. You can understand why a park owner would want to vet your contractor because at the end of the day, this is their park and they look after that park for the benefit of everybody. And I'm trying to make this balanced all the way through, by the way, because I think it's the right thing for me to do in my position and my situation. And you wouldn't want your neighbor building something which is horrendous next door to you. And the park owners need to make sure that doesn't happen. So if they have a, if your neighbor has a contractor who really is a cowboy builder, does a terrible job, it looks an eyesore, that potentially affects the value of your caravan. So the law, the courts would understand why that's in place, why a park owner has to have the ability to veto whoever you use. But again, that veto must be used reasonably and sensibly. And you need to understand what the veto is before you sign the dotted line. And if you have no idea um, what you're guessing into, then again, you're not going to be bound by it. So what you should also consider in this situation, if any of you are thinking to yourself or saying out loud that actually this is the problem I've got, it's about contractors, I've had this issue in the past. The next thing to um, consider is what were you told before you signed the dotted line? Before you entered into this agreement, what did they actually tell you? And you may recall if you watched the last live stream that I spoke about, it's on the screen now, section 50 of the Consumer Rights Act. This is all about representations that are made prior to the contract to you as the consumer, you as the caravan owner. So what were you actually told? Now let's keep this specific. Let's keep this to um, what were you told in relation to contractors? So if you were told that actually you always have got to use contractors that the park recommend on a on some kind of a recommended or approved list, then you went into this with your eyes open. If you were told that um, they'll always be the best price and everything else, then you, you understand exactly what you're guessing into. It's all about going in with your eyes widely and firmly open. That's what it's about. I'll pause for a moment for you to quickly read that because that section 50 is very, very important um, for what I'm discussing now. I did mention it last week, but just quickly take that in for a moment. So come back to that again. So what this is basically saying is if you were told that um, pre-contract, no, you can use it whatever contracts you like. I know because people are telling me that many people ask about balconies, for example. That's why I keep referring to it because it's probably the most common question I've had in this area. So it's highly likely that you've said, I want to build a balcony around the caravan. What's the rules? And they would have told you the size that you can have probably because it's part of their planning permission for the whole site. And the next question you probably asked is, well, can I build it myself or can I get my own person to build it? And if they said, yeah, that's not a problem, you can do that. Um, and the contract is silent on the point, quite a few I've seen have been, then the park owner can't then come back later and say, well, actually, um, no, you've got to use our approved provider. Because they told you, they made this pre-contract representation um, that you can use your own contractor. And what this clause in the Act says, the Consumer Rights Act, it says that now becomes a term of your contract. Very important um, because that's a very powerful tool that you will have. And I know that lots of representations are made by salespeople, um, not just with caravans, but even selling cars and all sorts of things. But here, when you're buying a static caravan, you would have heard lots of things like this. And I've seen these representations as well online. And I've seen these representations made in sales and promotional videos on YouTube. I think I mentioned that before. Um, I've seen lots of people saying they've had these representations. So I know it's a big issue. And that's why I labor this section 50, because it's a great tool for you to throw at park owners when you've been told something, which they then decide to renege on or conveniently forget, which does tend to happen. So let's stick with the law for a moment. I'm going to take this off and I'm going to come to another piece of law, same act, the Consumer Rights Act, which is Section 68. 
Now, Section 68 says that terms must be transparent. Why am I saying this? Well, because I'm using that situation where the agreement's silent, the salesperson's told you you can do something. In this case, you can use your own contractor. And now what's happening, um, it's not transparent. It's confusing. So let's move on um, what happens next if that's the case that you've been in. Because the very next section, section 69, says that where there is confusion or even a conflict, as I'm saying, so let's go back. Salesperson says, yep, you can use your own contractor, no problem. The agreement says otherwise, or it's silent. You now have a confusing and conflicting situation. So what the law that says about that, section 69, it says, whichever is the more favorable term, or most favorable position, that's what prevails. That's what is binding on the parties. Now here, of course, in my example I gave you, the most um, beneficial situation would be that you can use your own contractor. And this is going to be the case in many, many situations. And it will be the case for many of you watching this that are in that situation. So you could have actually gone back and said, I'm not using your contractor because I thought I could use my own. Or it was confusing or the agreement just didn't say otherwise. Therefore, I'm using my own. So what I'm really trying to say to this is that basically, um, in most occasions, you will be able to use your own contractor. Now, I mentioned a while ago the word commission because you may be thinking, well, are these parks looking for me to use their approved provider just because they want commission, because they're going to get some kind of a cut from what I pay the, the guy that, that builds the decking or whoever, or whatever it is. Is that the situation? Many of you tell me that it is. So what does that mean in law? Well, my view is that if there's a commission to be paid um, from a contractor that you've used to the park owner, you need to be told about it. Now, I'm going to go off piece a little bit here. We've all heard the word PPI, payment protection insurance, um, and that's a financial mis-selling uh, situation. Now, one of the reasons why the courts found there was mis-selling was when there was what we called undisclosed commission, where the lender or the broker, sorry, basically got the lender to pay them a commission um, for brokering the sale to the likes of you and me who bought the PPI. And the courts found that that shouldn't have happened and that commission should be paid back. Now, this is not a financial mis-selling situation. But what it does do, it puts a marker in the ground and shows that the courts and the consumer laws will not stand generally speaking, for undisclosed commissions. Now, what does it mean here? What it means here that if you sign up to a clause where the park owner is saying you'll only use our person, our contractor, if you don't know that that contractor is going to pay a commission to the park, it means you're not going in with your eyes open. Why? Well, because it means that you'll know that they're going to add that commission on top of what they pay, what you pay them. So therefore, the price is going to go up. It's always going to be wrong. Now, somebody um, sent me a message via my website earlier today, and this exact thing had happened. I named no names, but I'll read it to you. It says, by mistake, the contractor gave me a quote of £3,810 direct. The same contractor then gave me another quote for identical work, but this time through the park for £5,442. That's a 30% markup. That is a good example of what I'm speaking about here. Now there, this consumer received that quote by mistake. So he or she knew exactly what it was about. But it's a situation where that was by mistake. It shouldn't have happened. So in that situation, the park is wrong because they should have clearly informed that person that there's going to be a markup by using their contractor. They are going to be in the wrong. And I know this is going to be happening up and down the country. I'm going to stick on this point for a moment because at this um, at this point, there are park owners saying, well, we see nothing wrong with this. Why are you going on about this? This is all fine. No, it's not fine. It's not fine if you didn't clearly tell your customer before they signed the dotted line that that is what was going to happen. Now, if you as a consumer decide that you want to use the park's contractor, you don't want to use your own. You want to use one of theirs. That's slightly different because you've had the choice. I still think the commission should be disclosed to you, probably by the contractor themselves. 
But I get, but also by the park, I think they've got a juju to tell you that. But it's a slightly different argument. The argument is definitely stronger where you are somehow pigeonholed into using the um the contractor of the park. And if that's the case, in my view, it'll be wrong if you're not told about commissions. So let's recap this because um I appreciate it may have sounded confusing. I know I've rattled through it quite quickly because I know I've got quite a lot to do and I want to try and answer some more questions this evening. Let's recap very quickly. If you have an agreement that is silent on whether you have to use the parks contractor or not, then you do not have to use them because that's an important term they should have told you about. They should have made it clear at the start of the contract before you signed. Remembering that the Consumer Rights Act says terms must be transparent. The Consumer Rights Act says that key terms must be made prominent. Now, any term that has any financial impact on you that hits your pocket is always going to be a key term. Therefore, this is one of them. So unless he told you and made it clear and you had the opportunity to say yes or no to it, that's never going to be binding on you unless it's in the contract. Now, if the contract does have it in there and it says you do have to use their contractor, that's only binding if there is a promise that that contractor will be um, at a reasonable price comparable to any other contractor, uh, any other reasonable contractor that you could have gone out and got yourself. Now, I'm not saying you can go and get Bob down the road. He's a bit of a cowboy builder. He's going to do it for 50% of the price. That's not comparing apples with apples. I'm saying if you use a bona fide contractor who is good at what they do with a reasonable standard for the industry and the park owner's contractor is far more expensive, that's not going to be binding. So the clause has to say that you've got the right to do that. And if there's a commission, they have to disclose it. Or if like the new BH HPA, I think got it right, template, it says um, that you can use your own, but they have to consent. That's also going to be okay. So long as they don't unreasonably withhold that consent and don't delay it. So that's basically the general position. You will have questions about this because you'll all have different scenarios that you've seen um, that have come up with you. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is um, give me some of those questions on the chat um, and I'll go through and try and answer some of them. I'm not going to go through all of them because um, I want to go on to the, the selling of a caravan part shortly, but I'll try and sweep some of them up. And just to reassure you, any that I do not come to, I will sweep up in a video um, next week. So let's have a look. So Mark says, so if we get a quote from off site, they have to match the price with equal warranty. Um, Mark, I assume what you mean by that is if you, if you've got an agreement that says you have to use their contractor, um, their contractor, of course, has to be a fair price. Yes, if you go off and say and find other contractors that are far cheaper and they are comparable, the comparable bit is really important. Um, and you can say to them, this is comparable. As you say, there's an equal warranty. Then, yes, in that situation, you are in an unfair situation. Remember what I said at the start about the balance. There shouldn't be an imbalance in your position and the tra and the trader's position, in this case, the park owner. So if the park owner's got a situation where they can force you into using a contractor, they can grab a commission from that contractor, which pushes its price up, and you can do nothing about it. Well, what does that mean? It means an imbalance. If you put that on some scales, it's going to look like this, and it should never do that. So in that situation, that will be an unfair term or a term that may have started off as being fair, but has now gone to being unfair. It's an unfair situation. So in answer to your question, Mark, yes, um, if you did that, they would have to match it. And if they couldn't, then they're providing you with a service, a tied service that they should not be doing because it's unfair to you. Um, Robert says there's a quality comparison to take into consideration too. Ours is shocking compared to another's, others on another site. Robert, again, I'm going to take an assumption here because I, I don't know, but I guess what you're telling me is that you used a 
contractor which the park put forward because they forced you to. And the quality of work from that contractor was bad, shockingly bad. And if you'd used your own, it would have been much better. Yes, um, that's a situation where it would be unfair because they should only be um, pushing forward approved contractors that are good enough to do the job. If they're making you use that contractor, then they should only do that if that contractor is good. Now, of course, what we would say, and when I say we, I mean from the consumer side, is rather than concentrating, Mr. Park Owner, on quality, you've gone with a contractor that's given you a backhander, that's given you a commission, and you've worried more about your commission than you have the quality of work. What does that mean? Well, it's detrimental to the consumer. Again, what does it mean to the balance? The balance has gone like this, because all the good goes to the trader and you lose out. And therefore, there's an imbalance in the situation. And I keep coming back to that because that's the that's the, the root cause of these issues. That's the basics that traders, in this case, park owners, have to satisfy under consumer protection laws. And in that case, they wouldn't have done. Now, let's, let me just say this, though. Of course, the park owner will not be um, held accountable if a trader, if a contractor does a bad job. It's not necessarily their fault because it may well be that this contractor was brilliant. For 10 years, they built 100 deck deckings and they were all great. And now all of a sudden, this one was terrible. It can happen. Um, so only if you find time and time again that there is a, tra a particular contractor that's a, on the approved list, if we call it that, that's terrible, will we be able to go back to this park owner and say, hold on a minute, this is wrong. And they should be able to show you why they've chosen a particular contractor. And they should be able to say to you, well, um, the contractor was good because we had all these um, CVs from them and all these you know, good um, recommendations. They were the right price and everything else. If they can't do all of that, they are pushing themselves into unfair territory. I'll just look for the next question. I'll just quickly deal with this. It's a slightly different question, but um, Rebecca says, my park is not a member of BHHPA. I know I keep going on about the BHHPA, um, but the reason I'm doing that is because I've used their their template as a benchmark. And also because they do have a lot of park owners um, that they can reach who and who should be abiding by their own, their rules. So it's a good starting point. I do fully recognize and understand that this will not necessarily be the case with your park and i will be dealing with those as well not necessarily now but i think what we do is we conquer this first we get the bhhpa members in the right place it might be a battle but we get there and once we've done that we then start tackling everyone else using that as our benchmark um, as our platform as well now one of the questions i've had offline as in not through the um not through the template system there, is if decking um, is organized by the park, can consumers claim back if they potentially been overcharged? Well, the answer to that question is potentially yes. So if you find that actually you were charged, I'm going to pluck the numbers out of the air. Don't scream at me if I get them wrong. But let's say you were charged £2,000 to build decking around your caravan. I don't know if that's cheap or, or, or not. I don't know. Let, let's just say that was, that was the price. And you, and you find now that actually a comparable um, contractor could have done that for a thousand pounds, then you could go back to the park owner and say, you put me in an unfair situation. I've only just found out about it and I now want you to do something about it. That would be a potential claim you could bring. I'm not telling you to all run off to court and do it. This is a claim that you could bring. And this will be a situation that I will raise um, when I do my paper to the BHHPA. But if you found that, do get in contact and tell me so I know if this is a big problem or not. I suspect it might be. Do remember as well, though, if you go out and try and find prices now, because some of you may be thinking, well, actually, I'm going to go out and find out. Remember, you may find contractors in the current climate are willing to do it for cheaper. So you need to kind of find out what they would have done it for at the time that you had this work done. Um, so it's a great question, um, but it, ne it needs to be very carefully considered if you're going to go and have a look at this. 
Um, so John says, can we approach a contractor working on park and ask them for a quote direct or can the park block this? It's a very good question. Is, and, and the starting point is what does your agreement say? So if your agreement says you have to use their contractor, I'm guessing it probably doesn't then go on to say, well, you can't ask them or speak to them direct, but probably they'll have some kind of agreement with that contractor that they can't speak to you direct. Let's now come back to what the law says. I keep saying it, transparency. So is it transparent if the um, park owner fails to tell you what this contractor will charge? Not what they will charge you, but what they will charge um, what they would charge you if the park owner wasn't involved. I would suggest that would fail the transparency rules, the transparency parts of the Consumer Rights Act. And that's why John asks a great question, because um, I think that's something you could throw at a park owner. So if they insist on using um, their contractor, of course, you want to be able to benchmark their price with someone else's. Um, and you also want to be able to say to them, what would you charge me direct? I think you should also be asking the park owners, are you adding anything on top? Are you receiving a commission? If they refuse to tell you, then you've got some ammunition because they shouldn't be doing that, in my view. These are the sort of thorny questions that a park owner doesn't want you to ask. And that's why you should ask them. So thanks for that, John. Great question. So just to reinforce the point, Amelia says, I need a single car parking space. I was told by the contractor it would be £1,400. I phoned the site, £2,700. And again, is a great example of, um, so, you know, let me ask you this, Amelia, when you signed up to your agreement, uh, and it sounds like you're being told you have to use the contractor on site, did you for one minute believe that when it came to having any works done via that parts contractor, that you would be paying nearly double the price that you would be paying if you could go to someone direct. If the answer is no, and it should be no, then you have entered into a term which, in my view, is always going to be unfair. Why? Because you should always enter agreement with your eyes wide open. And this is something that the park owner has failed to tell you. They failed to inform you of this. And it's a very good example of why the law says when you as a consumer, sign a contract, you need to know everything, absolutely everything. And in terms of a, a contractor, if they're telling you you've got to use their contractor, you need to know what the deal is. You need to know if that means you're going to be paying over the odds. If they don't tell you and it transpires that you are going to be paying over the odds, that term is unfair, clear as day. Uh, Rick says, any independent traders will not be let onto the park. Again, Rick, I guess it's a situation where your agreement also says <clears throat> that um, you have to use one of their traders. Um, again, wrong, unless unless they confirm that their trader is always going to be comparable to everyone else and the same quality, coming with all the same warranties. So if that's not the case, and if you can prove otherwise, that's simply going to be an unfair term. Let me say this at this point. I'm going to push for this situation to stop. And I'm saying it loud and clear now because I know there are park owners watching. This situation must stop. You must go with what the BHHPA template now says, which is basically that consumers are entitled to use their own contractor. It's fair enough that you as a park owner should veto that, that um, contractor. Fair enough that you should be able to see what their credentials are you know, if they have the right skills and they are the right quality, that's fair. There's nothing wrong with that. Although what's not fair is you're not giving the same back to consumers in Rick's situation, by way of example. And it's not fair when you charge over the odds. Consumers should not be led into a situation where they end up paying more money than they would have done if they could have gone direct. Unless you can promise and you can demonstrate that every single one of those consumers knew that they were going to pay over the odds. Let's use an example. The park owner in Rick's case, if you can prove 
that Rick knew that when he signed his contract, he was going to have to use your contractor and your contractor was going to cost a lot more money than what he could have got direct. Unless he knew that, and you can prove he knew it, your term in his case is unfair. Simple as that. Let's move on to the next question. Um, I dealt with this last week, but I'm just going to deal with it again because um, Incognito Fox, great name, by the way, um, says, uh, and by the way, I know why you've said that. And um, I'll be highly embarrassed if your name really is Incognito, but of course I know it's not. And it isn't a shame that people have to do this because they are in fear of being thrown off the site. This is something else that I am going to be dealing with. And Mr. Park owners, Mrs. Park owners, corporate park owners, this has got to stop. This is all day long unfair. So if we were to challenge our park owner, he will throw us off definitely. Well, guess what? If he did, you would have a very good case of breach of contract because that should not happen because that park owner almost certainly will not be able to point you to a term in your agreement, your license agreement that says, if you complain incognito Vox, we're throwing you off the park because it'll be breach of contract. That clause will not be there. Now, if stupidly that clause is there, first of all, I'd love to see it. I'll put, put it in my new book coming out shortly of ridiculous terms and ridiculous comments from traders and retailers. But if it is there, then it will not almost certainly, it will definitely be unfair. And if a clause or a term in a contract is unfair, then the effect is that it's not legally binding. So if they kicked you off the site for that, they are in breach of contract and you could sue them. And I would hope that you would sue them. One of the things I'm hoping for is for um, people to contact me that have been kicked off parks for this reason. I've heard from a few. Um, not many, but I've heard from a few. I know there'd be more people out there in that situation. If that's you or you know someone that that's happened to, uh, please get in contact with me via my site, the consumer dot blog, because I'll be very interested to hear from you. And also I'll be putting that forward to the competition of Marcus authority, because that's just wrong. Uh, thanks for that question. Similar question. Um, what about parks who have no complaints procedure in place, do not offer ADR, which, by the way, is alternative dispute resolution, when faced with pitch related disputes, including their pay up and shut up ethos? What about those parks? Well, um, they should be giving you a complaints procedure. That's a matter of good practice. Um, ADR, alternative dispute resolution, is also good practice as well. Um, especially in today's climate, the courts encourage it. I know that I have seen many agreements where they do mention ADR, but I have to say the mention is wholly inadequate. It doesn't tell you who the ADR provider is in most cases, how you go about complaining to them, probably because they don't want you to, because they know at the moment, if there was a clear route for ADR, alternative dispute resolution, thousands of you would be going through that and that would cost them probably a lot of money. So I think there, that's an issue. But when there is no complaints procedure, no ADR, well, what you do in that situation is you write to the park owner first. Again, you go to my website, the consumerlawyer.blog. There are template letters about how to do this. You write to them first. You give them some time to respond. If they fail to respond or they say no, um, then you are perfectly entitled at that stage to go off to court, probably the small claims court, because probably your claim would be under £10,000. And that's what you would do. They don't want you to do that. But sometimes you have to do it because of this situation. The whole pay up or shut up ethos is contrary to consumer laws. Um, they can't make you do that. Of course, if you have no legitimate complaint, then they can. If you're not paying just because you can't afford to pay or you know, you're dragging it out for time, you can't just use a a made up argument just to do that. In that case, I can say pay now or we're going to kick you off the site. Of course they can do that, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about what happens when you have a genuine complaint. 
You want it to be aired. You want it to be listened to. Well, in that situation, you're entitled to complain. They can't just boot you off the site. That will always, just always be wrong. Um, this is an interesting question from Andy. My fear is we complain the park could move us anywhere on site with 28 days notice. To properly answer that, I'd have to see the clause. But let's just say this. Andy, when you entered into this agreement, did you know that this park at any time would have the right to pick you up and move you anywhere else on this park by just giving you 28 days notice? Because if you didn't know that and you weren't fully aware of that, then the answer is they wouldn't be able to do that. That'd be an unfair term. So let's use an example. Let's say you had the prime spot at the front of the park overlooking the sea. And the, and the park owner decided, actually, we're going to pick up Andy's caravan or pick him up and move him to the back of the site, which has got a view of perhaps a tree and not the sea. Could they do that? Answer, not without good reason, no. Because, of course, you're, you entered into this knowing that you had a, a view of the sea. And if I said to you, well, Andy, if you had known that that view could change at any time, so you had a view of the back of another caravan or not the sea, would you have still entered into the contract? You, I assume, unless you're mad, would have said would say to me, no, I wouldn't have done that, Dean. Therefore, this shows you that, in fact, it's an unfair term. And let's come back to the balancing again. Is that in balance? Yes, of course it is. Why? Because it may be the park owner wants to move you to an empty pitch, knowing it will get more money for your pitch, which has got the sea view. What does that mean? What it means is an imbalance because the park owner has got all the benefit. He or she or the corporate is going to make money out of that. You have got all the detriment. That's an imbalance. And that the law does not accept. It doesn't tolerate that. Um, in the situation we just explained, and will make that an unfair term. So whilst they may be saying they're doing this, this is something they shouldn't be doing. And by the way, just because it's been happening, it doesn't mean it's legal. Because my view is that in nine and a half times out of 10 situations where it has been happening, it's actually been anything but legal. It's been unlawful. It's been contrary to the Consumer Rights Act. And therefore, it's been potentially a breach of contract. I'm not just talking about this situation. I'm talking about all of them where you complain and they say, see you later, you're off, or you do something else and they say, we're moving the pitch. They can't do these things unless the contract says they can. And that term is fair for all the reasons I've explained. Just to be uh, balanced, I'm going to just say this. Damien says, there are a lot of excellent parks. Most are. Choose wisely. Check their website. Does it give caravan prices? Show pitch fees. Display their park rules. Give details on insurance cover. Question mark. Transparency in capitals. Yes, Damien, that's what I'm saying. That's exactly what they should all do. And I agree with you. There are actually many parks that are doing this right. Um, I've not only heard from people complaining. I've heard from many people who have said to me a bit like what Damien says now, that actually they have no problems and everything's going well. And their park owner has been very honorable during the pandemic and it's all been great. So just to keep this balanced, I will say, you know, yes, there are definitely are many park owners that are very, very good. This does not apply to everyone. Here's the problem. 18,000 people have viewed the last video. 18,000 odd viewed the live stream. There is a definitely a problem here but it's not with everybody, but it's significant enough for me to be sat here at one minute to nine on a Wednesday night talking to you all about this and for you all to be watching the screen, with, uh, watching me um, answer the questions and tell you what the law is. Otherwise, neither of us would be here doing this. So, that, so there is a problem, but Damon's right. It's not every single person. Bobby says, our park owner threatens us should we challenge him at all. We've been charged 20% VAT on electricity and overcharged for many things and told if we don't like it, then take our vans off site. Yep, again, this is something they should not be doing. Um, VAT um, should only be charged at the prevailing rate. 
this is another subject I'm going to deal with in a video after this, which is what happens when we all know, or many people will know, that the um, VAT rate was reduced for the likes of Holiday Park Homes to 5%, um, not permanently, but a temporary basis. Yet some park owner or some caravan owners were telling me they were still being charged at 15%. Or at twenty percent, is that correct? The answer is no. You're only illegally allowed to charge at the prevailing rate. But what probably happened is they were probably only charging you five percent, but they increased their prices instead. Unfortunately, it's not illegal. It's ethically wrong, um, and but they can get away with it. They shouldn't do it. It's completely wrong. Um, but here, coming back to Bobby's question, if you are being overcharged for the likes of electricity, that's never going to be fair. There are rules from the regulator off gem about electricity and what markups are allowed. Most parks, I think, do abide by this because I have looked at this and most say the right things. It may well be that this is a smaller park that Bobby's on. I don't know because I certainly most of the bigger players that I've seen are doing this correct. Um, but maybe this is a smaller one, but they shouldn't be doing it. I will put this in the video because I'll have to display some of the rules and it can be complex. But that shouldn't be happening. But again, let's ask Bobby the question. Bobby, when you entered into your contract, you signed on the dotted line. Did you believe that you were going to be, in your words, overcharged for anything, for electricity, for all the other services? And if you had known that, would you have signed the contract? Answer, no, unless you're nuts and you're not, I can tell. So that means probably... You have been, I've not, I've not said the word missold during these live streams, but misselling basically means you're led into something on false pretenses, basically. And that means you may have been missold or that clause, which deals with you using their services is just unfair and not binding. But ultimately you should not be overcharged for anything. And it means going out and finding comparable services that are cheaper, but they are the same quality. And therefore you should go back and say, well, hold on a minute. This is what I can get elsewhere. Why are you charging me more? That's a thorny, difficult question for parks to answer. If they can't answer it, then your clause, your term, your agreement is unfair. Um, let's look at this. So Steve says, unfair terms. Bought van from site new in 1997, pay an annual license fee. In 2019, they introduced 30-year age limit. In 2020, they changed the limit to 20 years and say, buy a new van by October 21 or leave site. Well, um, Steve, this will be whatever the terms were that you signed up to in your agreement. They will be the terms if that agreement is still binding, i.e. it's not come to an end. If it's still within a fixed term agreement, they can't change those terms um, unless you agreed in the agreement that they could. So let's say that the agreement says, as you said, well, your caravan um, has to be no more than 30 years old, but we reserve the right to change that at any time to 20 years to reduce it to 20 years. If you were fully aware of that when you signed the agreement that that could happen, then that could be difficult. You could have some difficulty in going back and complaining about that. But if it was silent, if the agreement simply said 30 years and now all of a sudden out of the blue, they've changed it, they can't enforce that change on you during the fixed term of your contract. Because again, you didn't know when you entered into the contract. And even if you were prior to the Consumer Rights Act, which by the way, well, it came out in force in October 2015. So let's say your agreement was entered into before that. They still couldn't do it anyway. So you would be OK. The problem comes is when your contract comes to the end, it expires, you now need to renew it. They can now impose those new terms. That's something they can do. And this is why when you enter into these contracts, these types of contracts, you should be asking this sort of question. What happens at the end of the term? What sort of things could you change? And again, it's about going in with your eyes open. And if the salesperson says, well, one of the things we won't change, we won't change the age limit of your caravan. That will always stay at 30 years. 
and you get that in writing, then that's a term that's going to stick even at the end of your um, current term contract period. It will still stick because that was a reason why you entered into the contract in the first place. Problem, many people don't get these things in writing. Anyone that listens to me on LBC on a Friday night, 9 p.m., quick advert, um, will know that I'm always saying when you speak to salespeople, always get everything they say in writing because salespeople have a terrible habit of forgetting things accidentally after the event. Well, I didn't say that. No, I don't remember that. I didn't say it. Of course, you know they did, but they deny it. So get everything in writing. But that's the situation there. So Steve, if if your contract doesn't say very clearly in a prominent place that they can reduce it to 20 years, then that's something they can't impose on you. Uh, Rick says, a clause in my contract says they can move my caravan to another pitch. Is that legal? Rick, I put the question back to you. Why did you sign a contract that said that? Is it because you didn't realize, you didn't understand, or it was in the contract and they didn't basically highlight that to you and you missed it? So if the answer to that question, Rick, is you missed it, you didn't see it, didn't really understand what it meant, or anything like that. If it's anything but, I did get it, I understood it, but I signed it anyway. If the answer is anything but that, that clause is going to be unfair. Because of course, that's a material clause. If you're entering into a contract for a pitch and you've done it, um, you've chosen your pitch because you like that pitch is superior, then they can't move you to an inferior pitch if you didn't know they were going to do that. Why? Well, because you will say, I never would have entered into this contract and signed the dotted line if I had known you could do that. So if you can say that with conviction, then that will be an unfair term. If on the other hand, you look at the situation and Rick, it's you, you say, I, I didn't know actually, I knew this could happen. Then you got a problem because you knew you went in with your eyes open. Yes, it's a clause that's not balanced because they get all the upside and you don't, but you clearly knew about it. So it may well not be unfair. There's still a chance it could be because you can run the balanced argument to say, well, it's a clause that is so imbalanced, it's so unfair that it shouldn't be imposed upon me. It's just not what I call and other lawyers call a slam dunk because you haven't got the other element of not really understanding it, it not being transparent. When you've got the two together, imbalance and didn't understand it, wasn't transparent, wasn't made prominent, that is an unfair clause all day long. When you've only got one of those um, factors in place, it's a bit more difficult, still maybe unfair, but a bit more tricky. Again, shouldn't happen. I mean, I, I think park owners will want to have um, the right to move a pitch, but it shouldn't be until the end of a term. When you enter into a contract and you're doing it in this case, because you want a particular pitch, that should be your pitch till the end of time. That means till the end of your contract, unless you breach that contract. And that's something else we should be pushing for in changes to this industry. Let's see if there's any few more quick questions. Again, if I've missed your question, forgive me. Um, I'm a one-man band flying through loads of questions. It's very hard to grab all of them. If I have missed your question, I will sweep it up in the video I'm going to do. Um, so we were told via Decking Company, Park add 60 to 70% on top of going straight to their cost. But we was told, please don't reply, as they have been told they cannot talk about costs. Well, I said this a moment ago, didn't I? I said that probably you'll find that it's the contractor that's told that they can't speak to you about money. They can't disclose to you the cost. By the way, 60 or 70% is never going to be on, of course. I mean, that's a, a ridiculous amount to add on top. And as I said before, if they're going to add anything on top, as a commission, both parties ought to be telling you, really, here the... Um, contractors disclosed it, but the park owner should be doing so as well. And here you'll be saying, well, if I'd known this, I would never have agreed a term in the contract. But I have to use your contractor. Again, my advice, go and see how much it could have been elsewhere. And if it's 60 or 70% cheaper, you will have a very good um, fight, a very good um, opportunity to go back and say, actually, that wasn't on. I need you to reimburse me for some of this money because that, that term was unfair. Uh, 
Uh, many people were saying that their um, agreements do say that um, do say that basically use our people or, or go away. Um, and I'm sure many do, but they have to do it in the corners of what I'm saying here. <clears throat> so Carol says your leader, 71 year old lady caravan being held to ransom by not allowing her to move her van using outside contractor. Well, um, again, I don't know what this lady's, um, 71 year old lady's contract says, but if it says that their contractor has to do the moving, um, that's okay. So long as their contractor has a comparable price, um, and is the same quality and, and, and is comparable in every single way, as long as it is, then that's okay. I'm guessing that this lady is, is saying, well, I could have got it a lot cheaper elsewhere for the same price. Now, if I come back to the BHHPA template for a moment, I've noticed in there that it deals with disconnection charges and basically says that you use them, but they will uh, only charge you what's comparable to outside contractors. Um, I think that might be a change in that contract of theirs. I don't think it said that previously, but that's what it should say. So well done to them. They've got that right now. But if your contract doesn't say that, again, it's just not going to be unfair. You cannot hold someone's caravan ransom um, on the strength of a, of a clause or a term in a contract, which is clearly unfair. Because what that means is you are lining yourself up as the park owner to be sued. And of course, in this situation with this 71 year old lady, I'll look at that, that with her and, and see where I can help because that's just not on. So clearly the answer to that question is no, that park owner now has a problem. Um, So the park owners reserve the right to make any amendment, modification or deletions to the T's and C's without prior notification. This was this was with previous owner. New owner, new owner, sorry, has changed upper. Uh, I guess you run out of words on there. That's the only problem with this chat facility. You can't put lots on there. I think I understand the question. Uh, no, you can't do that. Uh, no consumer contract will ever be binding where the trader, in this case, the park owner, has the right to change anything they want um, without the consumer consenting. Come back to imbalance. That's imbalance because it gives all the power to the park owner and no power to the consumer. And the consumer has all the detriment as well. And also, it's just never, ever going to be a fair situation because you do not know what you're getting yourself into. And I can't stress, stress this enough. If you enter a contract as a consumer and you don't really know what you're getting yourself into, either because they've not really told you or because they've not made terms like that clear and not made it, uh, not made, con not added conditions to it where um, you can go back and say, no, it's not fair. It will never, ever be a fair contract. So in that situation, that's clearly an unfair contract, which they cannot um, enforced on you. It just won't be binding. We will not be binding in any uh, situation. Um, there are more questions, but I'm going to answer those on the video um, because we need to move on. So I'm now going to move on to the next part. I hope that answers all your questions. Look, what I'm really saying is in most of your cases, park owner was in the wrong. They shouldn't have enforced upon you or forced upon you um, a contractor, which cost you more money where there's commission you didn't know about. That's never going to be right. By the way, there will also be situations where the contractor, the park owner forced upon you was really good. Um, that's why they did it. They charged you the right price. No complaint there. You can't complain about that situation. So if you are going to go and complain about this now, make sure you do your homework. Make sure that that um, contractor did charge you more money than you could have got elsewhere. And that your comparisons that you're making are with compa truly comparable um, contractors who have the same quality, could have done the same thing, knew what they were doing. That's important. Otherwise, you just do not have an argument. I think many of you will have an argument. I think this is something where park owners, and again, I'm not talking about everyone, but there are some park owners that have been um, utilizing this wrong and unfair practice. It has to stop. I hope it does now stop. And if, if you're a park owner that's done that, 
you should expect an email tomorrow from many people on this live stream, 1,039 of them, <clears throat> because you were wrong. So let's move on to the next subject. And while I do my techie bit, bear with me for one moment. <clears throat> so the next subject that we're going to talk about is, are the terms park owners are imposing when you sell your caravan contrary to consumer laws? And I know this is something that many people are very interested in. Um, now, we have to ask exactly the same questions here as we did for contractors. It's the same law. It's the same principles. So what? Do, firstly, what does your agreement say? What did you know pre-contract? Are the terms unfair um, within the act? As in the terms in your contract, do they breach what the Consumer Rights Act says about what is and what isn't a fair term? Um, the most common terms I've been hearing about are the percentage of the sale price you have to pay the park owner is ridiculous. You didn't know about it. Um, the obligation to let park owners sell the caravan for you. The obligation to get the park's approval in relation to buyers. So they have to veto the buyer first. The obligation to pay the park's disconnection charges if the caravan is moved off the park. So you, you sell it to a buyer that's not on your park, but elsewhere. Um, so th those are the things I've been hearing. I mean, there's probably more as well, but those are the uh, the most common situations I've been hearing about. And again, I'm going to base this discussion, this analysis on the BHHPA current template. Um, and for that, we turn to clause six, I've got it on the screen, which is headed selling caravans. Now, underneath that clause, there's a clause 6.1.2, and which gives the park owner the right to veto the buyer. And 6.1.2 says on the pitch, to a buyer approved by us in accordance with the provisions of 6.2. And 6.2 provides that the park owner may carry out checks on the buyer. Now, so long as the, v the vetting of your buyer is no greater than the checks that they did on you in the first place, or indeed the checks they would do if they were selling a new pitch or a new caravan on the site, then that's going to be okay, as in the, the principle of vetoing. Um, because So as long as it's not overly onerous, you know, again, I see, I see no problem with that. I see no problems with this clause six in the BHHPA agreement. And the reason for that is because, of course, they want to veto buyers um, because they have an obligation to do that to you and everyone else on the site to make sure um, that they keep the site in corners of what they've sold to you, you know, in a happy site. Now, it's not the subject matter of this evening, but they can't discriminate so they can't decide they don't want someone on the site because of their um, their religion, their race, or anything like that. Of course, they can't do that. That's discrimination. And if you have a park that's done that, that will be an unfair term to you because it's illegal. They can't discriminate. But I would hope that that's a minority if that ever happens. But they are allowed to veto buyers. And many people have been asking me that question, and that's the answer. So long as that vetoing is not onerous. So as long as they don't use this right um, as an excuse, as in a backdoor way to stop you selling your caravan, because of course that could happen. They could decide, well, we don't want Mr. Smith um, selling. Therefore, we're just going to say no to every single buyer. Well, they can't do that. If they do that, it automatically becomes an unfair term, which becomes actionable by Mr. Smith in that case. Now, I also know that where you sell to a buyer who is to remove the caravan, um, the park's disconnection costs come into play. Now, because what they say is, and in terms of the BHHPA, they say, and I said this a moment ago, that you have to use them to disconnect. Um, and of course, you have to pay them for it. Now, the, the current agreement with them is, is perfectly fine because it says they will only charge you what's comparable, what someone else would charge you. Um, and that's the right thing for them to do. But if you've got an agreement which doesn't say that, it doesn't say anything about comparable charges, and you are forced to use the park owner's suppliers, then again, that will become an unfair term unless they can show you that they're not charging you more than what anyone else would. And of course, this is where commission may come back in, because it may be they're loading commission on top, and therefore they are charging you more. If that's the case, um, then that's 
something they cannot do becomes unfair. And just by way of reference, in the BHHPA agreement, the clause that talks about um, disconnection charges is clause 4.13. I'm not going to go over it now. It's, it's not relevant because, um, not relevant in terms of, I don't think it's unfair. I think it's perfectly fine. So long as they abide by it. Because by the way, it's one thing having a clause or a term in your agreement that's fair and in accordance with the law. But of course, it's only fair if you actually abide by it. So if a park owner has this clause 4.13 in their agreement that says it'll always be comparable to other people, but they don't stick to it because they had commission, then actually, what does that mean? It doesn't mean the clause is unfair. It means they're in breach of contract. They've breached the contract they entered into with you because they agreed they wouldn't do that to you. And in that case, you'll have a cause of action. That's what that means. So um, just recapping with this, with the current BHHPA agreement, there's no problem with this, but with yours, there may be. You need to go and have a look to see what it says. In terms of what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to try and make sure that this bad practice that I know is going on across the industry stops immediately. So whenever you've got to use the park or <clears throat> a park contractor, it's always going to be on fair terms, i.e. you're not overpaying. And again, um, I keep speaking about what happens prior to a contract. It has to be made very clear to you prior to signing the contract um, what the deal is when you move your caravan. Because the Consumer Rights Act says that you're entitled to know everything with your eyes wide open. It also says, and I've said this before, but I labor it again, that key terms must be made prominent. Well, anything financial, you heard me say it earlier, is a key term. So therefore, if there is a term that you've got to use their contractors and it's going to cost you more money or whatever it's going to cost, that's a key term that they must make very clear to you. And if they don't, that term either will be unfair or it will be deemed simply not to be binding because they didn't bring it to your attention. So what you need to look at here is um, you need to apply a test. You need to ask yourself, does the agreement clearly state um, what it is you're getting yourself into? And if it doesn't, then that's going to be an issue. So let's apply that here. The, the caravan parks are saying to you, nearly every single one I've seen, actually, that you have to um, pay a percentage to them when you sell the caravan. So let's look at the test for that. Um, is that fair? Is it binding? So the first thing to say is, were you made aware of this at the start of the contract? Did they make this plainly clear? Why? Well, because it's a prominent term. In the BHHPA agreement, they do make this clear. Um, I think the agreement is fine in, in terms of this test. It passed the tests. There is a, um, a quick brief on page one as to what the key terms are, and that's one of them. But maybe your agreement doesn't. And if it doesn't, then it's going to fail that test because it's a key term that's not been made prominent. So that's the first thing you need to ask yourself in that situation. Then you need to say, ask yourself, what else does the agreement tell you about a sale? Does it clearly tell you what the process is when you come to sell your caravan? Does it tell you what the timetable is when you come to sell your caravan? Does it clearly explain to you that they're going to have the right to veto your buyer? Or is it simply silent on this point? If it's silent on any of those points, then the puck has no right to do any of that. So if it doesn't tell you that it's going to veto the buyer, they can't do it. If it doesn't tell you that they're going to add a charge or um, ask you to pay them 15% seems to be the, the common percentage, it doesn't tell you beforehand you're going to do that, then they can't charge you that. It's all about what you knew as a consumer before you signed the agreement. That's what you need to go back and have a look at. As I keep saying, the current agreement, um, which many of the park owners now have to use, looks fine. But, uh, but that's a fairly new agreement. And there'll be many agreements out there which do not comply with this. So you need to have a look at that. These terms must be clear. If they're not, they're just not going to be binding. Also, have come back to the veto rights. I've said it already, but I'll just labor it again. Are those, ask yourself, are those veto terms onerous? Are they greater? than what the park owner would have done, what they would have asked and checked if they were selling the pitch themselves, a new pitch, a new caravan. If the answer is yes, they are, then they're not binding. If they're comparable, they're the same, 
then they are going to be binding. These are all the sorts of questions that you need to be asking yourself. And I come back to the balance test again, because if the caravan owner, so if the park owner has a set of conditions for itself, a veto conditions that it asks buyers of its pitch, and it, and it asks, I say, three questions. But when it comes to your caravan and your sale, it asks five questions. There's an imbalance. And that imbalance is in its favor and to your detriment. And again, Consumer Rights Act says, well, in that situation, the term's probably going to be unfair. So again, these are the things you need to look at. And the reason I'm giving you the tests is that if you feel you're in this situation, these are the sorts of things you need to go and find out. This is the research and the homework that you need to do. Of course, what I'll be doing is trying to harmonize this across the industry to make sure that these that, you know, there is a clear indication, clear right for vetoes to be the same, whether they're selling their own pitch or um, vetoing one of your buyers. But I know at the moment this is definitely an issue um, that many people are experiencing. Now, if we um, come back to some law, and I have mentioned the Consumer Rights Act many, many times, um, but one of the sections of that I mentioned was Schedule 2. Now, Schedule 2, you remember, this is that what I call a grey list. It's a list of terms that may be unfair. That's what the law says. So it lists these terms, says may be unfair. And that's Schedule 2. Now, Paragraph 6, uh, sorry, Paragraph 10 of Schedule 2 says, a term which has the object or effect of irrevocably binding the consumer to terms with which the consumer has had no real opportunity of becoming acquainted before the conclusion of the contract. Basically, it's probably going to be unfair. I mentioned this earlier, so it's the second time I've said it. But the reason being, the whole test here is exactly the same with every term in your contract. So if I'm talking about, is it fair to be bound but to use their contractors? Or I'm talking about, is it fair to be bound to be paying them a percentage of your sales price and you and them vetoing your buyers, it's all the same legal test. So if we look at this paragraph 10, ask yourself this, when you entered into your contract, did you fully understand, number one, that you were going to have to pay a percentage of your sales price if you sell to the park owner? Secondly, did you fully understand they were going to veto your buyer and could say no um, after doing the checks? Did you fully understand what that meant? Did you fully understand that there was going to be a procedure to go through, if indeed there is a procedure that they put on you? Did you understand that procedure? And if they say in your contract that you have to use them to sell your caravan, did you understand that? Um, did that sit well with you? And did you know, did you go into the contract with your eyes open? Because you can see when you read this paragraph 10 again, if the answer to that question is no, if it's no to any of those questions, then this type of, of clause falls within paragraph 10 of Schedule 2 because you're bound by these terms, but you didn't really become acquainted with them, i.e. you didn't understand them. They didn't take you through them. A salesman didn't sit you down and say, Mr. Smith, just so you know, when you come to sell your caravan, we're going to take 15% away. We're going to basically sell it for you. We're going to check out the buyer. And if we don't like them, we're going to say no to them. And all the other things, if they didn't do all of that, then the term is probably going to be unfair. Now, just to um, pause there for a moment, you've heard me say many times this evening, and probably in the last live stream, probably unfair. The reason I say that is because I have to be very careful to say that we have to look at this on a, generally speaking, on a case by case basis, because there are certain things that can happen that makes a, a clause fair. And there are certain things that can happen that make it unfair. And it's not generic. So here, if the salesman clearly explained that the 15% would be taken from you on sale, they made that prominent in the contract by putting it on page one. And that's precisely what they did. That's fair. But if um, Mr. Jones, in his situation, they didn't tell him that, it was in the contract, but not prominent. That's unfair. So it is a case by case basis. But of course, what we can say is generically, there are mass um, practices, bad practices going on that affect many, many people. And in those cases, I can give you a generic answer to say, yep, 
basically this is why in that situation it's going to be unfair so i'm just being careful to make sure that you don't run off and think yep dean said this is unfair you need to look at your own individual circumstances and ask yourself those individual questions that i've posed what we are told think about what you were told what does my contract say i will say this many of the contracts i've seen the older ones are breaching the law definitely and anyone with those contracts is going to have a good cause to complain this is why what i'm trying to do is to get agreement that first of all this new bhhpa agreement which i think's 95% there is slightly amended so it's 100% fair in all respects and then that is used in all situations from here on in and then any people that have got a, a current agreement which is not that agreement which is many of you um the park owner agrees to enter into a amendment agreement we call it a deed of amendment where the offending clauses clauses such as you'll use our contract or whatever or go away are replaced with clauses that are now <clears throat> contrary to what the law actually really now says that's what we're going to try and achieve if we can't achieve it there'll be a good case to go to the competition and markets authority and say this is a sector where there is mass consumer detriment where there's lots of things going on which is unfair and you need to now intervene we tried because let me say this the fact we're trying if we don't succeed that will be great evidence for the cma to say actually yeah we've got to do something here because the park owners are just not listening so let's go to your questions um and i know again there'll be many on this subject and if i don't reach them all again um i will get through all of them in a separate video um Uh, let's go here. Uh, we are now charged a fee if we rent our caravan out privately rather than rent it out through them. It was added as a fee six or seven years ago. Now, I'm not sure if you're telling me that your license agreement six or seven years ago or before that didn't provide that they can charge you this fee but it now does if that's the case and you're still in the same agreement let's say it was a 10-year agreement for example or 15 whatever um then as i said before they can't change that term they're not allowed to do that because you're in a fixed agreement but if you came to the end of your agreement and you entered into a new one and in the new agreement they added this this term then in those circumstances it's easier for them to do that but there is another argument you could run because you could say when I entered into my agreement five, 10 years ago, I did so on the understanding that you would never do this. Therefore, that you're now doing it means you mid less, um, misled me, sorry, originally. Now, that's more of a difficult argument to run because you'd have to prove they said that, which would be difficult, but you could. So I think the answer to your question is, if you're still in the same agreement, they can't do it. If you've changed agreement, they could do it at the end. Hopefully that makes sense, but I will uh, redo it later. Um, if selling your van privately on site, the owner demands 15% of the sale or £2,000 plus VAT, which is greater. So if your van is only worth £4,000, they still have to get £2,500. <clears throat> um, it's a very good question, that. And I have to say, um, it's a term that inevitably must be unfair because again there's an imbalance because the trader in this case the park owner um gets a huge benefit and you as the owner caravan owner have a huge detriment so that that clause cannot be fair and again i'm going to sound like a, a beating drum going on over and over again but you know you ask yourself here tracy when you entered into the agreement did you ever think that could happen answer must be no Otherwise, you wouldn't have entered into that agreement. Therefore, I think you're going to be able to say, um, you know, I never thought that would happen. That clause just cannot, cannot be right, cannot be fair. Um, I don't know when your agreement was dated. It may well be pre-Consumer Rights Act. 
But even the law we had before that in terms of unfair terms was fairly strong um, and would still have said this anyway. So I think if you've got a clause like that and you get into this situation, that's not going to be right. You'll be able to complain about that. Um, is it fair that our park can terminate your occupation of a pitch for any reason whatsoever? Answer, no. Um, I think everyone knows the answer to that. Of course not. Um, because there's no way you would have entered into a contract knowing they could just kick you off at any time. Again, it's not balanced, it's not fair, um, and it's not the right thing for them to do. So no, if you have a fixed term contract, um, there will be a termination provision in there, but you have to have breached the contract for it to be invoked. And if you haven't, then that's not going to be a fair term. Now, if you knew when you entered into it that it was not a fixed term contract and it could be um, terminated on notice for no reason whatsoever, that could be a different situation if and only if you were fully aware of the situation. Here, with these types of agreements, I doubt that's going to be the case. So I think mo in most cases I would look at like that, I'll be saying that's an unfair term. Um, well, so this is interesting. Bobby says, if park owner is not a member of BH HPA, maybe I'm getting it wrong, but I'm still going to call it that, but is using the previous owner's plaque indicating that the caravan park is a member, where as caravan owners do we stand? Okay, good question. Now. There's, and there's two issues with this. First of all, um, you should go to BH HPA and tell them because I'm sure they will come and tell these people to stop doing that because, of course, they shouldn't be doing it. But there's a second part of the answer to this question because if you entered into an agreement with this park after this happened, so when you entered into it, you thought they were a member, but they were not. That comes back to what I was talking about earlier, mis-selling. That means you were clearly missold the contract because you may have entered into it believing or on the strength of the fact that they were a member. You may have thought, actually, the fact they are a member of this gives me some comfort. I don't know. Maybe you will think that. And therefore, I'm going to enter into the contract. If you could say, I would not have signed it if I had known they were not a member, then that contract was missold. You can rip that contract up and get your money back. That may not be desirable, but that's the answer to the question. Um, so they shouldn't be doing that. This sort of bad practice happens a lot. And let me say this. If you have any other complaint um, against, in, the, in this case, this park owner, and you decide to go to court, that sort of information would ordinarily sway a judge in your favor because that's a terrible and a bad practice, which would show any court um, that this park owner just doesn't care what consumer protection laws say. Um, I read this because it's a question to all of you, really. Stephen says, at point of at the point of purchase, I was informed I would get at least 20% of the value of the van purchase price at the end of the license agreement against a new van. Now this is now this is now not true. How many were told this? Well, I'd be very interested to know who was told this, because again, if they tell you that, and Stephen, I don't know if they verbally told you or if it's in the contract, but if it's in the contract or you can prove that it was told you verbally, then of course it's the term of the contract that they must stick to. And if they don't, they're in breach of contract. And you can go to the court and claim what we call specific performance, which is basically where you say to a judge, I entered into a contract and on the strength of getting 20% of this value back at the end, they're now not doing that. And I want my 20%. Now, of course, Stephen, if you're not at the end of the contract yet, then the judge won't say you can have it now. But what he will do is, or she will say, you are entitled to it. So you'd get what we call a, a declaration that you are correct. And it would therefore mean that at the end of the contract, they'd have to give you that money. Or you could just go back and say, again, you missold me the contract. I want all my money back on ripping it up, whichever one was desirable. But effectively, all the rights would be in your court. You know, let me say this at this stage. These park owners can't make the rules up as they go along. They can't promise you one thing and then do another. They can't say, here's a term and then pull it away later. 
They can't do any of these things. I know some of them are doing it, but they can't do it. And they can't say to you, if you complain on your bike, you're terminated. They can't do that either. So most of these things that you're being told are contrary to consumer laws and are actionable, which means you could take an action um, for the breach. Again, I'd be interested to know from, hear from other people as well if um, they have a common, a similar situation to Stephen, because that's something which is not good. Um, I'm just looking through all of your questions. Um, slightly different question from Daryl. Lots of owners told there was no problem living on site before signing the contract, including being told to get a PO box for mail and then found out it's not true and stand to be evicted. Um, <clears throat> actually the reason I put this on the screen, because it's not quite the same as what we're talking about, but it's because I've heard this quite a bit actually. And the last few days, lots of you have been telling me the same thing. Now, it comes back to what I'm talking about, what you were told pre-contract. If you were told that and you can prove you were told that, it becomes part of the contract. Now, of course, the contract, most of the contracts I've seen do clearly say you can't live there. It can only be a holiday home. That's because of a few reasons. One will be planning permissions, um, the local authority council tax, and all sorts of reasons why you shouldn't be doing that. Um, but if you're clearly told you can do it, contract says something else you come back to one of those confusion situations where you may be able to argue that the consumer rights act finds in your favor the problem here is that if it's a legal issue and by law you can't live there then the law will prevail it will override the situation and say that well actually you can't take advantage of the confusion because it becomes contrary to the law you know a, pl a local planning law whatever it is so this would be a difficult situation. But what you could do is you could go back to the park owner and say, I only agreed to buy this pitch um, or pay a certain pitch fee or pay this much for the caravan on the basis that I could live there full time. I'm now told I can't. So you've misled me. I've overpaid. And in that situation, you could claim a reduction in what you've paid and what you're paying based on that misrepresentation. So that's something you could look at. Misrepresentation is a, a very wide and complex area of law. It covers fraudulent misrepresentation, which can be criminal and all sorts of things. I won't go over that now because it's too deep a subject to, to do. But what I will say is any of you that have had the same situation as Daryl, the law is going to be on your side. This will be a very big sledgehammer that you can wave at the park owner and they will be extremely vulnerable if you can prove this is the case. And again, this is something I think we should highlight when we're trying to uh, get improvements um, in this sector. I mean, very similar here from Robert. He says, I was told six to eight K after 15 years on a 45 K caravan verbally can't prove as the warden left. This had a major factor on us buying. Well, of course it did. Um, anything financial that you're told pre-contract will always have a big impact on your purchasing decision. But, the, you know, Robert highlights the problem when you don't have it recorded. Um, and again, anyone listens to me on LBC on a Friday night, advert time, 9 p.m. Well, no, I'm always saying if someone, if a salesman gives you um, any kind of promise, representation, pre-contract, get it in writing. Because if you don't, it's hard to prove. Now, if lots of people on your site um, say the same thing, that's going to be fairly persuasive evidence. Um, it doesn't mean a court, if you go to court, it's always going to believe it, but it certainly will be more persuasive than one person saying it. And again, I'm hearing um, what Robert's saying here. I'm hearing this sort of thing all the time. So probably this is a case where this is happening. It's bad practice and shouldn't be happening. But certainly if I bring this back to the BHHPA agreement, 
that makes it very, very clear what the rules are in terms of whether you can live there full time or not. So the current situation is fine and we need to make sure we filter this through elsewhere. Um, Helen says, is a finance contract void if the age of the caravan is older than what is on the finance agreement? Um, the answer to that question is probably yes. Um, difficult to answer it conclusively without seeing this agreement. But when you enter into a finance agreement, you are telling the finance company all the details of the caravan. And, and that's relevant because if you default, that finance company will take that caravan off you and sell it. So they want to know what is the asset they've got as security for the money that you're paying? So if you say it's five years old, um, the finance company will calculate what it's worth and decide whether that's good enough security. If it turns out to be 10 years old, the security may go to the point where they say, actually, we're not adequately secured anymore. Therefore, we're going to terminate the agreement. What I'll say here, though, is that if when you um, take out finance on a caravan park, nine and a half times out of 10, the park owner is the one that basically facilitates the agreement. They It's usually their finance company that they're tied with that provides the finance. And usually they're the ones that writes up the deal. So they're the ones that will be putting in the agreement, how old the caravan is, the make, model, and all that sort of stuff. So if they've got it wrong, you shouldn't be detrimented. You've got an action against them because they're the ones that caused what would have been a misrepresentation and therefore caused you the loss. So as I say, the, the answer to your question, Helen, is yes, technically it could definitely void the agreement, but it may well not be your fault. And if you are asking me this because your situation is, as I explained it, it was the park that got it wrong, not you, then you are going to have something you can do about that. And I, again, I'd be interested to hear if other people have had that, because if that's the case, that's a whole nother big issue that we need to start highlighting, because if park owners are getting people finance off the back of incorrect information about caravans, that's terrible. That's probably criminal, by the way, and it'd be very worthwhile us knowing about that. So do tell me if that's the case with you. Um, I think if this one is talking about the same thing, I'm hearing a lot of sites are doing this and changing the age limit of vans. Is this legal? I think that might be a different one, but if that's saying um, the after the contract, the contract says it's 30 years um, and then they reduce it to 20 years. Answer, no, it's not legal if you're still in a fixed contract and that contract did not provide that they can change it. And even if it did provide they can change it, it's still questionable whether it's an un unfair term. Um, because there's a huge imbalance. Again, I probably need to see more information, like a copy of the agreement to give you a definitive answer, but I'm going to be looking more at this when I draft up what I'm going to be doing. Um, some of us are retired and can't afford to take action in the courts. And that'd be many people um, because people worry about taking action in courts. Let me say this. The small claims court was designed to, um, be used by non-lawyers with no lawyers going there to be cheaper than the normal courts, as in the full county court or high court or anything else, and to be a far simpler process. And ordinarily, it does go like that. If you go to court and you get it totally wrong, sue the wrong person, um, just sue sue the, the park owner for something you shouldn't have been suing for, there is a chance that a judge will say, this is so bad, I'm going to order you to pay their costs. But ordinarily, there's no what we call cost orders in a small claims court. And that means if you go to court, it shouldn't cost you a lot to do it. It should be very simple to do. And if you claim the right thing, and this is why I, what I'm trying to do is educate you on what you need to do, then you should win. And if you don't win, it shouldn't cost you anything more. Um, but look, um, Christine, in this case, what I'm trying to do is to get a situation where you don't have to go to court because you shouldn't have to do that. You should not have to go to court to enforce your consumer rights. That's why this country adopted things like the Consumer Rights Act. That's why I say nearly every week on my LBC radio show that we've got some of the best consumer protection laws in the world. We do. And for that reason, you shouldn't have to go to court to enforce them. The regulators should be doing that. But here, the park owners should be looking at this situation and saying, look, we now realize we've got this a bit wrong, so we're going to rectify it. And that's what I'm calling on all park owners to do because people like Christine shouldn't be worried 
about spending money going to court. That's wrong. The more people that do end up going to court um, in this situation, a situation where they shouldn't be, the more likely it is, and by the way, this is not an encouragement, but the more likely it is that the likes of the Competition and Markets Authority will feel the need to step in and stop the consumer detriment happening. And that's a message to park owners, not, not caravan owners, because I'm saying to you, don't let it happen. Let's get this sorted. Listen to um, what I've got to say. Take your own legal advice as well, obviously. Um, and I think it's an easy fix. There are many things that are going on here that just should not be happening because we don't live in the 60s anymore. We live in a society now where consumers are listened to and are greatly protected. I'm going to go to one more question because of the time. But again, I will um, deal with all of these questions in a video where I will do a very quick fire Q&A and answer all the questions and um, to make sure that you all have your questions answered. And I'm sorry I can't do them all tonight. It's just so many that it's very, very difficult. Um, so I'm going to do this one because I've heard this question a lot. Spent £5,000 on wooden decking last year. Now told, if I sell it privately, as in the caravan privately, I assume, it has to be removed. Also, new buyer has to pay £250 annually on top of ground rent. Um, now, if that is the case, they have to have told you that very, very clearly in your agreement. So they have to say, remember I said at the start, well, in terms of selling your caravan, ask yourself, did they tell you the process? Did they tell you the rules? Did they tell you everything? Well, I've not seen any agreements where they say this. So if this is something they make up after the event, then that's going to be an unfair term. And one of the reasons for that is because you're going to say, well, hold on a minute, that £5,000 decking enhances the value and the saleability of my caravan. Therefore, I don't want to take it away, as well as the fact that it, it, will, be, um, it will cost you money to remove it. There's a huge imbalance there, total imbalance. Why would the park owner ask you to do this? Well, there may be two reasons for it. And if I was arguing this in court, um, and if I was, I'd win, by the way. Um, but if I was arguing this in court, I'd say to the judge, well, the two reasons are in my submission. Number one, because it will put buyers off buying. Therefore, it will put you as a seller at a disadvantage. Therefore, you may go to the park owner for help. And it will mean that the new buyer, if you're a park owner that says you have to use their contractor, will have to use your contractor and the park owner will get a commission from it. That must be why. So when I apply my um, balance test, the park owner gets all of the benefit from that clause and the um, caravan owner, the seller in this case, gets no benefit whatsoever. So that term, in my view, will always be unfair. So Cynthia, if you have that in your, your agreement, you ought to be telling that park owner to watch this live stream back and tell them that that's just going to be an unfair term. Um, the £250 on top of ground rent, um, not quite sure what you mean by that, but if you're telling me that um, that's an automatic term that any new buyers get charged extra over and above what other people do, again, if you didn't know about that at the start of the contract, that appears to me to be another barrier um, stopping you or encouraging you not to sell, which is frankly wrong. And again, in my view, will be unfair. With the big caveat attached, that it's a case-by-case -case basis, depends on what they explained to you, what they told you in your contract and everything else. But generically speaking, in, in many cases, I think that'll be an unfair term and it will just be wrong. So just to um, sum up, again, sorry if, not, if I've not reached your question, I am going to get through them all in a separate video. But just to, just to sum up here, um, park owners cannot force you to use their individual contractors unless it's a fair scenario. A fair scenario is they told you all about it pre-contract. You knew what you were getting yourself into and you're not paying more than you would have paid if you'd gone to someone direct. Unless, of course, they told you that. If they said, you're using our contractor and by the way, it's going to cost you X percent more than it would have been direct. If you knew all about it, it may be fair. It might not be, but it may be fair. But in any other scenario, that's going to be an unfair term. So immediately, there will be many of you that are sat on terms or with terms in your agreement that are simply unfair. 
Um, and that will not be right. And I'm hoping that that's something we are going to be able to change moving forward. Um, because, of course, they shouldn't be tying you to these things. In terms of selling your caravan, um, the percentage charge you get is in most occasions going to be okay. So long as they told you about it, you had your eyes open, you knew what it was. Um, vetoing buys is going to be okay. So long as they told you about it and the veto the checks they do are not onerous, not over and above what they do um, when they sell a pitch by themselves direct. Um, adding any other charges like what we had a minute ago is often going to be not okay and unfair. Again, unless you knew all about it and it's a fair and reasonable charge, which often um, from what I've seen, it's not going to be. Many of these clauses are historic back when I think park owners could do whatever they wanted. There is this conception that park owner owns a bit of land. And when you come on it, they can basically tell you to do whatever they want. So whatever they say goes, they're the law on their little bit of land and what they say goes. That's used to be the case when we had cavemen and caves. Those days are now gone. And even if you dress up as a caveman, you can't act like one because the consumer laws now, as I keep saying, um, are pro-consumer and they give the consumer many, many rights. And there are many situations where a term will be unfair. When you spend your hard-earned cash as a consumer, you must do so knowing precisely what you're going to get. And if you don't, the park owner in this case is always going to be wrong. And I want to finish this by saying, and I said it before, um, not every park owner is a villain. Many of them are doing it right, uh, are doing, you know, are being fair to consumers and doing the right thing. But there are also many that are just not getting it right. It may be because they have been misinformed by their advisors or just didn't realize, okay, we'll give you a chance. You need to change it now. Others will just be doing it because they think they can do whatever they want. That just needs to change. I hope now we are going to get this change because um, in many, many circumstances I've seen that you as the consumer, as the caravan owner are right and the park owner is wrong. So to recap where we're going to go from here, I'm going to sweep up all the questions from this and previous live stream and do a, a, a quick fire Q&A in a video and I'll post it up on to YouTube sometime next week where I answer all the questions. I'm going to draft the amended ag template agreement send it to the BHHPA. I'm also going to do the same with the NCC um, and invite them to also use that as their standard template. And then I'm going to go out wide to all parks and say, this is what you now need to do. If everyone does it, great. If they don't, uh, that's the time we'll go to the CMA with all of this great evidence from, from what you've all been telling me and uh, see what they have to say about it. I'm certain they will find it's unfair and they'll step in and do something about it. Um, I'm on LBC radio on Friday night, 9 p.m. If you've got a question, you can call me during that show on 0345 6060 973, or you can tweet me at Dean Dunham or at LBC Friday night. Um, I do try and answer as many questions on that show as possible. And there you can speak to me on the phone. Difficult to do it on here. Um, but otherwise, if I've missed your question, I'll sweep it up in the next video. Um, I wish you all a uh, good evening. I hope that's been helpful. I'm really trying for it to be helpful. Please be patient with this because there is a lot to get through with this. There's a lot of things that got to change and we need to do it in a very methodical and strategic way, um, which is what I'm trying to do. And we will, and we will get there. I'm certain if we don't get there, the CMA will step in. I'm certain, um, but be patient and let's together as a collective, I think we'll get the change or the changes I should say that we need to do. Um, anyone that you know, that's not watched this, please encourage them to watch it. The bigger the numbers we have, the more notice park owners, associations, the likes of the CMA will take. We need another 18,000 plus with this to, so people know that this is a serious matter that you're taking seriously and you seriously want change. Um, I'll speak to you again, hopefully, very soon. Thank you.